Jeff Gerwitz here for Modern Tactical Shooting. Now this is the first in a two-part series on the complete history of the SOP Mod program. That is the Special Operations Peculiar Modification Program. This will be the complete history based on my use using SOP Mod Block 1 and 2 in both Iraq and Afghanistan. So let's go! All right, my goal for this video and for part two when I cover block two is try and provide uh, more detailed information than what is generally out there about the SOP mod program. Specifically, when items actually made it to the teams, what items were popular with the guys, you know, what items were used most in Iraq and Afghanistan during the war on terror. Those tidbits of information about SOP mod that just the general public doesn't know Stuff that you only know if you actually served on an SF team. So hopefully I can provide that in these next two videos. Now, just like my SCAR video, my M1911 and SF video, and why SF chose the Glock 19 video, uh, this video series is not based on any sort of deep internet research. It's going to be based all on my firsthand experience. And 90% of the photos and videos I'm going to show in this series are all mine I took while on my deployments. I am going to use some outside sources. But again, 90% of the pictures and the content uh, in this next two videos is all pictures I took while deployed in both Iraq and Afghanistan up until the time I retired in late 2016. All right, so lastly, before I start covering SOP mod items, let me talk a little bit about my history and how it applies to Special Forces and SOP mod. I spent seven years in the regular infantry. In the beginning of 1997, I went through selection and I was in the Special Forces qualification course as an 18 Bravo, that is a weapon sergeant. I didn't see any SOP mod items in the Q course, the only thing I saw was the brand new M4A1. We only had carry handle sights to train on. We didn't have any soft mod accessories at all. Now the soft mod program on the internet interweb says it was adopted around 1996. I arrived on my first special forces team in fifth special forces group in September of 1998. And they were still getting items in at this point. The soft mod program had actually been on the team or been within fifth group about a year before I arrived, but some items had just shown up in the last six months. The uh, Special Forces ACOG, for example, is one item. When I showed up in September of 1998, the guys on the team said they had just got those in about six months prior to me showing up and they had yet to even open them up and train with them. So I took it upon myself as a young 18 Bravo to read the manual, learn how to zero these things, and then we took them on a, a normal training deployment to Kuwait in early 1999. It was the first time my team actually trained on the ACOG. So when I arrived in Special Forces in September of 1998, most of these SOP mod items had just been issued in the last year. So I just missed the initial issue of the SOP mod program. But again, a lot of the items weren't even used yet. And I'm going to get into the detailed history from when I showed up on the team up until I retired in 2016 with the implementation of all those soft mod items. So let's get into it. Now going into 1999, we went on a deployment to Kuwait and we tried out all these soft mod block one items that we had at the time, which consisted of the ACOG reflex site, which is the Trijicon reflex site, the ACOG four power day scope, we just called it the SF ACOG, a red dot visible laser, the ANP Q2 IR laser, a Knight's Armament sound suppressor, and it required a Knight's Armament flash hider, and the visible light illuminator, or the visible light as is listed here, and the rail interface system, or the RIS-1. Now there was a lot going on in 1999. That was the year the regular army adopted the Aimpoint Comp M2 or the M68 as it's referred to. That's a four minute of angle dot Aimpoint. Uh, we had the Trichicon Reflex site, which was powered by Tritium. It's pretty dismal uh, trying to find that amberish dot in daylight. It wasn't very popular at all. Also in 1999, that was the year that the Crane soft mod manual came out. And this was issued to 18 Bravos. This manual tells you how to mount and zero all the optics and accessories. And more importantly, this is the first manual that contained marksmanship 
shooting techniques such as standing, kneeling, prone, how to do reflexive fire or up drills, your close combat shooting techniques. This manual was ahead of its time for 1999. In fact, it was ahead of its time so much so, the Army would not see a similar manual with the same amount of marksmanship information until 2016 with the release of TC3. 22.9 the updated army marksmanship manual so again this came out in 1999 yes the information as far as soft mod block one items is totally dated since we don't use any soft mod block one anymore but the marksmanship training techniques some of them are still pretty valid and this is a wealth of information so pretty cool manual if you can find one uh, i highly recommend getting your hands on one now, speaking of manuals, there was actually an earlier version of the Crane Sop Mod Manual. This is the SOCOM Manual published in 1998. I didn't find out about this manual until 2017 when I was doing research on the history of Sop Mod for SWAT Magazine. I did a two-part articles, which this video series is based on. I'll put a link down in the description. But this manual never really made it to the teams. I found it in research. And it's basically an early version of the Sop Mod manual. Some of the illustrations, you can tell it's not as high quality as the Soft Mod manual, the Crane manual. It's just not a fine finished product, but it contains the same information. So again, if you can find a 1998 SOCOM Sop Mod manual, it's a pretty rare item, kind of unique piece of history. Now, another item that came as part of the basic SOP Mod Block 1 was the Combat Sling, which is basically a multi-point sling, which came with a Knight's Armament Rail Connector and a Hush Stalker Sling Swivel. I still have mine today attached to an original car stock. I actually ran this sling and car stock uh, all three tours that I did in Iraq uh, from 2003 up to 2005. This is the sling system I used. I know multi-point slings are totally out of date and out of favor with the shooting crowd, but back in the early 2000s, this was the way to go. Now, going into the 2001 invasion of Afghanistan, I didn't participate in the 2001 invasion of Afghanistan. My wife was going through a difficult pregnancy, so I kept me back. I was one of the few SF guys from Fifth Group not to deploy. But going into that, a lot of guys went with the ACOG just due to the mountainous terrain. Now, this is a picture of ODA 574. This gentleman right here, Daniel Petitori, he actually lost his life during that deployment. Unfortunately, this team took some friendly fire from an errant bomb during an airstrike, and they took a lot of casualties. But here, they're all rocking ACOGs. In this photo here, you can see some of them are rocking carrying handle iron sights. And you'll find quite a few photos of SF guys in the early days of Afghanistan rocking iron sights. It wasn't because there wasn't enough soft mod block one items to go around. They ran iron sights by choice because that's what they were comfortable with. Up in, it was a mentality thing. Up in, you know, when soft mod first got issued, some of those guys already had a dozen years in the army and in special forces. That's all they knew was iron sights. They were totally comfortable and competent rocking iron sights in combat. So instead of messing with some new items, some of them could, you know, uh, worrying about them fail, they just went with irons. And you'll find that in a lot of early days in Afghanistan pictures. Now in the summer of 2002, we saw our first phased upgrade of some of these soft mod block one items. And the Trichicon reflex sight was replaced by an Aimpoint Comp M2, the M68 as the Army calls it. Again, the Army went with the M68 back in 1999 for their M4s, that was the first optic the Army went with. Army SF, even though we're Army, we fell under SOCOM and Crane. All our accessories and everything comes out of Crane, Indiana. It's a Navy base. The Crane program's overseen by the Navy. So separate, whole separate department. That's why we didn't get aim points out the gate because we fall under SOCOM. So that's where our optics come from. But we finally got aim points in the summer of 2002. And the dismal visible light illuminator, that stream light, plastic bodied light, it took six double A's to work or three CR123 batteries, which we didn't see CR123 batteries till about 2001. So that light wasn't popular at all because it took a lot of double A's to power. It was heavy, plastic fragile. That was replaced with the Surefire M962 fat bodied light. All the M962 Surefires that came out later on are all thin-bodied. 
the first generation, they just called it a visible light illuminator also. That was the M962. Now the Army went later on with a Surefire M951, which is a little bit shorter, but we had a fat bodied M962 Surefire light. Also in the summer of 2002, we saw all our M4A1s getting replaced in fifth group. At this point, most of them were over five years old with fifth group getting their M4A1s in the middle of 1996, around that time frame. So by 2002, they had already seen their service life, service life having being used in combat. Now getting an all new batch of Colt M4A1s direct from Colt, we noticed a problem. We had about a 17 to 20% failure rate with failures to extract with this brand new batch of guns. And this was out the gate. Uh, Colt did the right thing. They sent a bunch of Colt specialists down and it was determined that these guns were having all these extraction issues because the chrome was laid improperly in the bore and chamber. I believe it was laid too thick. So when the guns heated up, they would hold onto the cases and the guns wouldn't extract. Colt did the right thing. They replaced all the troubled M4A1s but Crane, Indiana, again, soft mod under Crane, decided they were gonna do their own solution and to prevent anything like this happening again because there were some extraction issues mentioned from M4A1s when used in heavy combat. They came up with the Crane rubber O-ring and the new five coil extractor spring and the longer extraction spring plug. So that's where the Crane O-ring came from was from those extraction issues from a bad batch of Colt M4s. And this, these extractor springs and the crane kit, of course, would be used up until about 2010 when Colt came out with an upgrade, a newer extractor spring, which is a bronze four coil spring, but the coils are a lot thicker, so no need for the crane O-ring. But it's standard issue uh, today, and I believe in the crane O-ring comes in a majority of your civilian AR-15s. So, a pretty good little uh, piece of kit that came out of a basically a manufacturing problem. Now, of course, in 2003, I took part in the invasion of Iraq and I was part of the southern thrust and that was from Kuwait up into Baghdad. So going to Baghdad, we were all expecting urban combat. So the optic of choice for most of us was that Aimpoint Comp M2 or the M68 as the Army calls it. Of course, we ran those surefire lights and the PEQ2 IR lasers and vertical grips. Now, if you look at this photo here, this is training in Kuwait. Uh, I'm holding on the vertical grip with a full palm. Back then, that's how we were trained. We didn't know any better. Uh, we were like, okay, we're issued a vertical grip and we were trained to hold it like this. Of course, it creates a left and right pivot point. It's not the most stable method. We know that now, but back then, that's how we rolled. This photo here, this is actually from downtown Baghdad. We're standing in front of a blown up BMP. As you can see, we're all rocking aim points. Now, this gentleman on the far right, this is Captain Andrew Nags at the time. Uh, after his time as Special Forces, he actually got out and became the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations Combating Terrorism from 2017 to 2019, still serving our country. That was a position appointed by Trump. So a great American, you know, still serving our country today. He actually later went on and ran for Congress I believe for the state of Virginia, but I still talk to him, uh, a friend of mine. So yeah, pretty uh, fun fact about this one gentleman right here. Now for us going into Baghdad, the ACOG was not a popular choice at all. Our ACOGs, we called it the SF ACOG. It only had a BDC illuminated by tritium for at night. You know, the army would adopt the ACOG RCO, which had a Chevron illuminated by a fiber optic rod, a CQB style reticle in it. So it's kind of practical for CQB. We didn't have that. The ACOG is great for, you know, the mountains and the deserts, but for CQB, it just wasn't acceptable at all. So you won't see a lot of guys who ran ACOGs in the early days of Baghdad. Now it was around this time frame. I don't remember if it was just before our 2003 deployment, but I know it was before 2004, we went with the SOCOM heavy barrel, as you can see in this photo here. It's a heavier barrel with the idea that the barrels would last longer. It's got a cutout, the square cutouts, just so the M203 can slip on around it. Now the regular army in 2010 would adopt the M4A1 and retrofit all their M4s with this heavier barrel, but we had the SOCOM heavy barrel back in 2003. 
Also around this time frame, we actually switched from the Riz-1 rail to the Army Raz rail made by Knight's Armament, but the difference is the Riz rail, the tension screw that kept the rail locked in around the barrel was in the front, and the Raz rail is identified by a screw in the back, and the Raz was just a lot more solid. You know, that softmod Block 1 Riz came out around 1996. The Raz is just a much more improved, stiffer rail. Now going into my second Iraq tour, that was 2004, basically had the soft mod block one item. With those phased upgrades, I rocked an aim point, that same surefire light. Now you're still not going to see a lot of Knight's Armament sound suppressors getting used by special forces in the early days of Iraq and Afghanistan. It was not a popular suppressor, and we never got a full set of 12 for the team. I remember we had four or five when I first showed up in 1998 for our rifles. And then it was around 2003, 2004 when we got the brand new Silicon barrels. We were issued, issued a few more along with the proper flash hider, but I never saw a full issue of sound suppressors for the whole ODA. And honestly, they didn't get used a lot because we just didn't have the mentality of running suppressors. Uh, I remember thinking it's just added weight and length. Why do I want to run one when the, we're going to have the full sounds of battle around us? Of course, when Soft Mod Block 2 came out, that's a whole different story. Way better sound suppressor, very practical, and I'm all for using suppressors in combat. But I'll touch more on that once I start talking about Block 2. So going into my 2004 deployment, I was assigned to a city named Ouija, or a town. It's basically a hellhole. And if you ever paid attention to the news when ISIS was rocking Iraq, uh, Huija ended up being an ISIS base later on too. So Huija has always been a hellhole. But we were assigned to Huija. I rocked that aim point. Basically the same stuff I used in 2003. Soft mod block one with the phased upgrades. Now it was my third tour, 2005. Just prior to deploying, we actually got our first EOTEX or the SU-231s as it's listed on SoftMod Block 1 and 2 charts. I believe it was an EOTEC 552 model. We got them. Here's a picture of me rocking one in Mid-South. We were training on them. Guys like the aim or like the EOTEC because it has a nice one, at, one minute of angle dot, a nice fine center dot, as opposed to the aim point, which the aim point M68 has a four MOA dot. So trying to shoot past 300 yards with one on a human-sized target can be difficult because the dot appears so big. Now also, in 2005, we received some Gas Buster charging handles. They were a popular item, not because they cut down on the gas blowing out of the chamber, but because they had an oversized latch. The mil-spec standard latch on an M4 is based off of 1965 specs, at best 1985 with the M16A2. It's dismally small and guys like that larger latch. We got four or five on the team and then I never saw any more getting issued. And that was a problem. We would always get upgrades, but there would never be enough for the entire team. Because what would happen is SOCOM would issue out soft mod upgrade items. They'd get spread, divided up to all the groups. The groups would divide up those items to the battalions, they'd divide them up to the companies, and then they would get divided again down to the teams. So when something new came out, most teams only got four or five, never enough to outfit a 12-man team. And we would never see a, another issue of those items. After my 2005 tour in Iraq, in 2006, the SOP mod crane stock came out. I saw a four or five get issued to the team and I never saw another reissue of SOP mod crane stocks my entire career. That's why you see a lot of SF guys rocking their own stocks and grips and things like that, making the gun as shootable to them as possible, you know, outfitting it to them, personalizing it to optimize their shooting ability. It's just a weird thing. You would never see some items fully get implemented to all the teams. And speaking of items not making it to the teams, I ran an Ambi selector on my M4. It actually came off of a Mark 12. It was from a Mark 12 spare parts kit. When the Mark 12 rifle SPR came out, it came with a DPMS Ambi safety. Uh, now the Army went and converted all their M4s to M4A1s around 2010, 2011. The upgrades came with the SOCOM heavy barrel and Ambi selector and a uh, switch to burst to full auto. But 
up until the time I retired in 20, late 2016, our guns never got ambi selectors. Again, our guns fall under crane. The ambi selector was a big army program. I think all the guns have ambi selectors now. They come with them. But during my time in SF, we never got them. Again, as an 18 Bravo, I took one out of a spare parts kit for the Mark 12 and I ran it through all my tours of Iraq and Afghanistan. Let me talk real quick about the HK Steel Mag. We actually, I saw HK Steel Mags getting issued out around 2001 uh, as we teams are going into Afghanistan. The original HK Steel Mag came with a stainless steel follower and then later on as it became a regular item in the inventory, uh, it got switched to a black follower. Those black follower HK steel mags, I saw no benefit using them over uh, normal aluminum mags. Loaded, they weighed twice as much as an aluminum mag when it was loaded. And those black follower HK steel mags demonstrated no added reliability. Now the original stainless steel follower HK mags, those were pretty stout, but those were in a first issue in 2001 and everything after 2001 were those black follower ones and they uh, just didn't seem to run as well. Now also around 2005, I saw early versions of the Mark 18. Now normal SF teams did not get the early version of the Mark 18. Uh, tier one units such as SEALs and Delta of course got early versions of the Mark 18. And Special Forces SIP teams, they got early versions of the Mark 18. They're tier two SF, the normal SF team is viewed as tier three. I also saw, but I did not get issued, ACOGs with piggyback mounted uh, doctor sites on them. And that was an early solution to the urban combat that started to rear up uh, in Baghdad in the middle of the 2000s. Is dealing with long range and short range threats at the same time. The quick solution was to throw a red dot on top of the ACOG. Of course, the only problem is you have crazy height above bore issues with a red dot way up there, but that would pave the way for when Block 2 came out, the Elcan Spectre 1 to 4 variable, power, variable powered scope. So there it is. That is the history of SOP Mod Block 1 as I saw it and how I saw it being utilized and the timeline when things actually made it to the teams. Soft mod block one items would be used up until about 2007. That's when we started to make the transition to block two. Now it's subjective. Some people call block 1.5 when we were getting aim points and surefire lights. Some people call block 1.5 when you're rocking a standard M4A1 with a Riz rail on there with block two items and then later on a full block two when we got the Riz two handguards but I'll save that for part two of this video. All right so there it is that is the history of Softmod block one as I saw it and used it. Now this video is actually based off of a two-part article I did for SWAT magazine back in 2017 on the history of Softmod block one and two. I'm going to put links to it down in the description. Of course, stay tuned for part two where I'm going to cover the implementation and adoption of soft mod block two, which I was there for the rollout and I used up until my last tour in Afghanistan in 2015 and really up until I retired in late 2016. So stay tuned for that. Hopefully I'll have that here uh, in the next week or two. But hopefully you, as always, found this video entertaining and enjoyable. And as always, I'm Jeff Gerwich. Thanks for watching. Real quick, if you like shooting and you're interested in training with me, check out my website, moderntacticalshooting.com. I run courses regularly here where I live in North Carolina out at Woody's Rifle Club, and I do travel out of state for people that want to train with me. As long as you got eight or more shooters, I will come out to you. I keep my class sizes small, no more than 12. That way we get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time, a lot of run and gun. So if you're interested in by all means, uh, contact me through my website or any of my various social media outlets. Again, hope you like this video. Thanks for watching.